Thank you.
what, what they were is, um, it, it's actually really funny. I, uh, I didn't get to see any of this before I flew to Charleston. In fact, I didn't get to see any of this before I had to agree to the contract. I just have, they just have to say, yeah, they, they say, you just got to sign it, say yes, and then we'll show you everything. So I had no idea how much was done, right? Okay, I could have gotten there and found like a book that needed one, one last chapter. Um, that probably wouldn't be the case. And Terry wouldn't be going and looking for another author that case. She'd finish one chapter. Um, but I had no idea what I was going to see. All I knew was what, that he had written the last scene of the book. Um, he had said for years he had in mind, so when I was on the phone with Harry, and I asked, you know, uh, did, do, did he actually get that written? She said, yes, he did. We do have that. So I knew that much. Um, so I flew to Charleston. It's kind of a hard flight from Salt Lake uh, to Charleston because there's no direct flights, and it's like all the way across the country. So I'm like there. I'm exhausted. It's like 9 p.m. I walk in the door, and Harriet had left a, um, a, a soup on the stove. She was, uh, went over and started warming up. Said, "Do you want some? Do you want some dinner?" Uh, I was laughing soup. I don't know. You know, these little details. Remember? Um, and I said, "No, ma'am. I'd like the ending, please." <laughs> Um, right on top, with a post-it note, and a post-it note was who killed that It was written right there. It was actually like a, a piece of paper, and then um, a fan theory that Robert Jordan had written, this is right, and stuck a post-it note to it. And that's all I knew about um, and, as Monet, but, um And then I started looking through these notes. And this is, this is really like where the fire hose turns on. Um, they had printed off um, a lot of these for me. And, and, and in this stack, I'd say there were maybe 200 pages there. Uh, that they handed me. And then there was a CD uh, on top of the DVD or whatever, you know, like, um, and on that were all of his, um, his world building notes. Um, and I, I once, um, if you guys have followed my Twitter and stuff, I once took this and I, I tried to add all these things together. Because on this, on this um, CD, which was a replication of what was on his computer, there were just like folders and folders and folders, and they're like subfolders, and there's like, you go dig down like five folders deep, and there's like one file there. It's like its own weird organizing structure, right? And it basically, they'll be named things like, you know, for book 11, remember this. And it'll be like character notes in this city, and just random things. Like, and I just decided I'd just take Microsoft Word, and I would add these all together into one file just to see how much there was. Because Harry always said there was more in notes than there, there were actually words in the series. So I did that. And um, at about, um, what was it, like three points, so four, around four million words, um, my computer crashed. Um, <laughs> and my Microsoft Word said, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, so four million words, the entire series is, I think, three million something, um, even with my books. So, so yeah. Uh, there's a lot of notes there, and they're very chaotic. Um, and this is, you know, these are, this is the equivalent of like, I don't know, like Da Vinci's um, sketch pad, right? Over, um, you know, 40 years of his life, where we just sketch something and move on or go nuts. That's how I imagine. Robert Jordan would have like a file with like a paragraph in it. And then another one would be like, you know, 20,000 words of a, a, a list of character names. Like one time um, I, I asked, I, I was, I was kind of confused in the early process. I'm like, who are all these people with paragraphs? When I read it through, you know, I've read the books multiple times. I'm, I'm a Wheel of Time fan, but I'm not, I'm not the detail or any type of fan. Like, I, I knew all the main characters, but I didn't know the names of the side characters. I'm like, yeah, there's some Aes Sedai hanging out with him in there annoying, right? And there's some <laughs> guys over here. And they always, you know, they, then they fight, and Paragraph is confidential. But I'm like, hey, who, who is here? Um, with parent, right? And I said, can you, can you give me a list? I'm like, well, we found this in the notes. Um, this is Robert Jordan's two assistants. They send me back um, a point to get a file, and it says with parent. I'm like, oh, good. But no, this was not um, the people, that, that side characters. This was names of all the two rivers folk that did not yet appear by, in, by name in the book, and their professions and their ages. Um, <laughs> right? Uh, like, just a list of, uh, like, 100 names. Um, that sort of stuff is in, in this CD. And this is crazy. It's got a lot of repetition in it, too. Um, like, all of the glossaries are in there. So if you search for someone's name, you end up with 11 glossary files that are basically the same, along with all the stuff that, you know, he said about them. So, you know, it's, it's, there's just so much in all of, all of this stuff. It, it, was, it was really hard to sort through. Um, and that's why the assistants had printed off these 200 pages, which they thought were the most relevant. 
Um, and the idea was that I would take these 200 pages, and that would be what I would work from directly. And other questions I would, of course, would welcome to search through the CV, but I could really just ask the assistants, and they would play Google and spend a couple days diving in and coming out with an answer if they could find it. Um, and so the 200 pages were really what became um, the, the last two books. The rest is all there, and we, I made extensive use of it, but I made extensive use of it through my personal librarians who do a lot of new work on it. And so the 200 pages are what I usually refer to as the notes. And in here, there were um, some completed scenes that Robert Jordan had written before he passed away. This included um, much of what is now the epilogue um, of the last book. Um, that, that was the last scene that he talked about. Um, there, are, there are some parts of the, of the epilogue that are mine. Um, and you can bring up the book, I can point them out to you. But, uh, but the last scene and, um, and various, uh, a big, the bulk of the, the epilogue was his. Um, he had written a lot on prologue for the book, which when it was, the book got split into three, we took um, a chunk from each of his prologues and put it in. So um, that includes like the, the scene with the, the borderlander and his son on the tower. Um, it includes the scene with the, um, the old farmer on his doorstep watching the clouds roll in. Um, and it includes the scene where, uh, the, what is it, there's um, Rand with some, um, some Shan Chan. It's from Shan Chan viewpoint. I think it's the Soldan and things in there. Like, they're all freaking out because they're, you know, they're looking at Rand, right? It's right in Gavin, which is prologue. And then there's the, the scene with uh, Slayer um, Esau in the last book. Um, the things like scenes like this um, in the prologue, he done quite a bit of work on prologue. Um, and then there were little scenes here and there through the whole um, the, the sequence that was at that point one book. Uh, the, like the scene where Wayne gets a, an unexpected visitor at the White Tower. Um, uh, I believe it's called Cup of Tea, uh, that chapter. Just that scene, not the whole chapter, but just the scene where this person shows up. Um, the scene at the end of um, Towers of Midnight, where two characters get engaged, um, that little scene, just like, you know, fragment, like five paragraphs, and then, you know, a big sequence in the Tower of Genji um, was, was written, and, and things like this, like, um, just fragments, and they weren't in any particular order. The assistants had just put them in there in a pile, and like, we don't know the order of these, we've got to guess, this is what we think. Um, I eventually ignored that um, because he had given me the instruction where these things were to go in order and sequence with one another. Um, underneath that were his own note files for specifically book 12, um, which were, um, you know, think notes to himself, make sure this happens, or, you know, parent is going to do this. We, I, in, in, in the last battle, here's what parent's going to do. Remember to, to, to put this in. These are notes to himself, which means they weren't terribly clear all the time. Uh, because he used to be like, remember, it's like, remember the break. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jim. My uh, real name was, uh, was Jim or name. Um, remember the break. We'll do that. Uh, that was an actual one that was in there. But you know, stuff like that. So, Phrases that I just stare at me, and my colleagues just be like, "What?" what? And they're like, "No." <laughs> yeah. uh, do it, do what you can. You know, Daniel, I get Daniel on the book. They knew about that one, but anyway, it's it's, it's just all of these things. And then after that were the Q and A's that they had done with him, basically on his deathbed. Um, when it, it became clear that he um, that he was really sick. Uh, that, that the time was, uh, was growing short, um, he started talking about the book. And he didn't normally do this. Um, he was very private about the process. He would carry it. She says he, she would never see something until it had been through 12 drafts. Um, he liked to present a story that was polished and done, but even to his assistants and things. And so he just started talking. And they grabbed um, a voice recorder um, and just recorded him talking through things. The scene with the farmer was actually dictated. Um, and then he started, it, it, this is the famous talk where um, if you've read about from Wilson, Robert Jordan's cousin was there, and, um, and they were very good friends, and Wilson said, Robert Jordan looked at it and said, there's a village in the blight, and nobody knows about it. Um, <clears throat> not even Harry. <laughs> and uh, he started talking, um, and, and these sorts of things, and, um, and just started going, and the, the um, Wilson would ask questions to Harriet, Maria, and Alan. They'd say, what's going to happen to this character? And they'd say, well, this is where they end up. 
Um, and a lot of those are focused on actually the, the very last part of the last battle and after, where everyone was going to be, what their, what their final state was. Um, and so I would, I would split those groups up pretty evenly in those 200 pages. Uh, maybe 50 pages of written material and then, you know, um, 75 of each of the other or something like that. I haven't done a count on it, but that, that was what was handed to me in a big stack. And um, from there, I was to craft the, the final book, trying to do my best to keep his vision. Um, but there, you can imagine, there were enormous holes um, in that. Uh, Robert Jordan, um, you know, he didn't get a lot of it written. He got a lot of it planned, um, but he didn't get a lot of it written. And in some cases, he felt a lot like a Wayne in Gathering Storm. Um, he basically had everything there outlined. Everything that happens to her in that book, but he didn't write it all, but he had um, the majority of it in, in very specific detail. I was able to pull phrases from his notes where, you know, where it basically becomes a quote from Wayne that Robert Jordan had said in his notes and things like this. And that whole sequence with her being rescued and, and, um, and the, the Shang-Chan attack of the tower and everything was point by point what Robert Jordan said to do. Um, for Randy Gathering Storm, we basically had almost nothing. Um, and so it's like, um, you know, the, the, the first things we, we know of Rand are things that are, that are happening later in the sequence. And, um, and so in that case, you know, we knew something needed to be there from stuff we'd said. Um, from, in that case, I had to go to the, um, to the books, which I, I started on in January, right after I picked this up. Well, this is 2008 then. And I reread the series. You can actually read my reactions as I reread the series. Um, I did a series of blog posts on it. Um, and built an outline using these notes and my own instincts. And this is why they had to find someone like me. Um, if it had all been there, they really um, could have uh, put it together themselves. Maybe hire a ghostwriter to finish up a few things and have them all completed. But it, it wasn't a mistake. They needed someone who could actually construct the plot, not someone who could just follow an outline. Um, and uh, she said she chose me because she liked my writing, but she knew I was also a fan. Um, because I had read the series multiple times, and this was just a project they felt they needed to give to someone like that. Um, and so, for, across the next six, seven months, I constructed an outline. I worked from an outline. Robert Jordan didn't work from an outline. Um, he, he was a, what we call a discovery writer, and I'm, a, I'm more of a, an outline writer. Um, and I built this thing. Um, I flew to Charleston again, and I brought my outline. Um, and we sat and we brainstormed the holes. Um, and I'm like, we need something here. Here's what I think should go here. And they're like, no, that won't work. Do this. And I try to pitch things to them and talk them into things. Um, and there, I, one of my big talking points to them at this thing was, we can't do what's comfortable. We can't write this book in a way that we don't take any chances, that we don't do anything. You know, we, we can't have it just play out exactly like everyone's going to expect. Um, we can't be so careful of, um, uh, of wondering what Robert Jordan would and wouldn't do that we don't take chances because he would have. Um, if you read this, he, 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 I mean, the thing with, with, um, with Varian shows that he wanted to be audacious in, um, in this last book. And um, this is one of my big fears, that we would just play it safe point by point. And at the end of the day, we'd have a bland book where we didn't take any chances because we were too afraid of, of you know, creating a new canon or of, of, of you know, of, of changing character arcs or completing character arcs as I envision it, things like this. Um, and so we, um, I, I pushed them toward more, um, uh, I, I, I was a force for pushing, let's, let's take chances. Um, and they became a force for, we're going to try and, um, and in many cases stabilize us and make sure we're not pushing too far. And that's where Unfettered came from. Um, the, my story in Unfettered, um, the, uh, the, the guy downstairs, I think it's Mysterious Galaxy has it. It's the um, deleted scene from A Memory of Light, a deleted sequence. Um, which is from the viewpoint of um, the Mandarin. And this, so this sequence um, you know, is one of these things that I'm like, let's push, but so Shara. I know Robert Jordan said we weren't going to be there for a lot, but you know, we need, these books are about world building and about new things, and let's try showing this. This is me pushing. And then we got it done, we got it in the book, and we realized we pushed too far. 
um, because having an entire new culture that we're running into in the last book was too distracting from what the last book should be about, so we cut it. Um, and you know, that's Harry comes and says, this is, this is too distracting. And I think that balance between us, and she was completely right, that, that sequence didn't belong in the book because of those reasons, um, allowed us to be audacious, but also not go too far. Um, and that was the balance that, that we were really striving for. So I built this outline. Um, in Towers of Midnight, um, Matt is more Robert Jordan. Uh, specifically, he did a lot of the plotting of the Tower and Genji sequence and then wrote some of it. Um, and Perrin is more me. Um, in fact, we, we didn't know a whole lot about what Perrin was to do other than Robert Jordan was coined with a confrontation with the White Cloaks. Um, he didn't exactly say what that confrontation would entail, just that we had to deal with the White Cloaks and Perrin um, in, in that book. And so Perrin was basically, you know, me. Um, Perrin's my favorite character. I'm like, I'm going to do a Perrin book, darn it. You know, I've got three books. I'm doing one uh, um, with, with Perrin. And so um, uh, a lot of Chapters of Midnight with Perrin was me. Um, and then in the last book, um, a lot of the beginning and ending were Robert Jordan. Um, specifically, the, the confrontation at the Guild of Marilor, he had plotted out very, um, in a lot of detail, had a lot of things for us to do. And then um, the epilogue, he had a lot of things in there. And specifically, um, uh, Rand's confrontation with the Dark One, uh, he, uh, he told us the soul of what we're to capture. He didn't tell us specifically what to do, um, but he, he had told us what Rand needed to discover and the conclusions he needed to come to, and kind of we came up with, I came up with a pitch statement to them, how to make that happen in a visual kind of dynamic way. Um, and so there's kind of a breakdown of the books, uh, of what's going on. And I try to avoid talking too much specifically, like, is this scene you, is this scene Robert Jordan? Partially because I don't remember anymore. Um, you know, I've been working on this thing for six years now. Um, I guess it's how long it's been, and I don't know which things these days come from um, a random thing I found in the notes. I'm like, oh, we need to make sure we include this, and that we build a scene around it, or where he talks about a scene, and which things were me reading his books and saying, man, this really needs to have um, get, get fulfilled in the last book somewhere. And the assistant said, we don't know what he's going to do, so I'm like, all right, I need to use my best instinct to do it. And which things were somewhere in between all of that. Um, and so I spent, uh, I spent all that, what, five years um, working and compiling this and writing this book, and now it's finally done. Um, and the other big question I get from people is, uh, how does it feel? <laughs> and it feels like I uh, put down an enormous weight. Um, I'm so glad that I was able to carry it for a while, but I am also very glad to ever put it down. It was a very hard thing. Um, writing these books was up, did the hardest books by far I've ever written. Um, it took twice as long to write in the scene in a little time as it does in one of my own books, just because I have to make, have to make sure I'm getting all the, the viewpoints right, all the characters right, all the side characters right, and all these things. And, um, and it was it was just a really big challenge. Um, it forced me to grow a ton as a writer. I, I grew by leaps and bounds. You can go find, you know, if you go read um, you know, the Mistborn series and you Way of Kings, you can see my, uh, my author development, uh, writing style, what I think, just by being forced to, to crunch these big weights um, and things like that. And I'm enormously pleased and, um, and honored to have been a part of this. Um, I, you know, Robert Jordan was one of my heroes, and being able to help out at the end, this is the sort of thing that just, you know, doesn't happen, right? You don't have, this doesn't really happen to people. Um, you know, I, I dream someday of, of becoming a writer and actually making this at, um, as a writer for a living. And that alone seems like this mythological thing that I can maybe never even uh, obtain. And then having to go this far to being able to work on um, the book series that inspired me to make a writer, um, it's been amazing. So there's my little spiel, I guess, that was less, less a spiel for me rambling much. Um, but let's have you guys, if you have a few questions for me, um, go ahead and ask them. And I, I would like us to have some chance to let the audience ask too. So, yeah, go ahead. One of the questions I have is um, you had news that aren't too often those that talk to too long, but it does happen on screen. So, is there anything you can tell us about that? And also a little bit about what happens in Tell Around Your Heart when the heroes know their past mistakes, or aren't often realizes he made a mistake with the kind of guy? <laughs> um, okay, let's see. There's a, these are there's a couple 
couple questions here. Um, okay, first one on uh, what happens between uh, Arthur Hoffman and Tuan. Um, keep in mind that, um, yes, Arthur Hoffman was, um, was under some dark influences during his, his career, but he also, even without that, would not have been very fond of Aes Sedai. Um, he's not the type that would have been very fond. And um, I think he and Tuan would get along swimmingly. Uh, despite him probably having some, some tough advice for her and, um, and things like that, um, I think that he would be very proud of the Shangchan as a nation. Maybe not completely proud of everything they've done, but the fact that somebody kept his legacy and was that strong with it, I think he would think that they are completely awesome for what they've done. Uh, and maybe he would, they would have had some words about other things. Um, you, the Robert Jordan was planning to do a sequel trilogy about Matt and Tuan as main characters specifically. We only know two sentences about what he was going to write in that, um, in that sequel trilogy. Uh, one of them was, and I'm not going to get these exactly, um, and Harriet may have, she said she was going to release them, um, so she may have posted, posted them somewhere she's planning to. So these are just, you know, I, I'm not getting the exact lines, but one of them is uh, Matt is like in a gutter somewhere, and this is wearing a knit hat, or a knit hat, and he's like gambling everything away, um, or something like that. And then the other one is Karen is in the, the um, belly of a ship sailing somewhere, we don't know where, thinking about how he's got to go kill a friend. Um, and those are our, this is what we have. We're not going to write those. Um, they, would, they couldn't be Robert Jordan's. They would have to be too much someone else's. Um, and it's best to just let it be done, um, we, we feel. But anyway, so I think they would get along, but there would, there, would, there would be words. And I specifically didn't write that because I, um, I knew that, you know, that would have been something that would have been for the, um, for the outlaws. Um, that, that whole conflict, um, two on versus, you know, what is right with, um, with, with the demonic and things like this was something Robert Jordan was specifically planning to deal with in that trilogy. And I just felt it was best not to try to, to, to wrap it up here. Um, and the second question was, what did, how much do the heroes know about the, the world at large while they're in there? Um, I, um, from things you can infer through the books, um, they do know some. Um, they don't know, uh, they don't know everything, uh, but they do know some things. <laughs> <laughs> Just go read what, uh, how much um, Brigitte seemed to know. And, you know, a lot of what she was getting, she was doing by watching people let her tell. So, there you go. So, for a large part, obviously, you had um, direction on what events were going to be happening. Mm -hmm. How much guidance did you have on the internal evolution of the characters? Um, this was one that I, where I was, I had more free reign. Um, specifically, I mean, Robert Jordan would talk about things. He talked about where Rand needed to go, um, and specifically, like, I, I want to spoilers, like, he, he says, you know, one of the big things Rand needed to realize, character moment-wise, was he needed to come to understand that the Dark One was necessary. That without the Dark One, um, that there would be no, no choice, which is actually kind of interesting because um, I'm sure lots of people thought that I put that one in. Um, because that's actually a, a big uh, element of Christian theology and, um, and Mormon theology and things like that. But it was a specifically the thing that Robert Jordan said for, um, that Rand needed to come to understand. Um, he also needed to learn how to laugh at him. Um, and this was, um, this was indicated in there that we knew through the course of this, not the ending, because the ending was about this other religion. Before then, he would learn how to laugh again, and he would need to enter the last battle as somebody who could laugh again. Um, and so I knew that. And so that's actually some fairly good character direction for him. Um, but for Karen, I didn't have basically anything at all. Um, my own instinct said he needs to, you know, he, he's put aside um, the axe, but what does that mean? You know, what does it mean? He, he um, Karen was the one that I felt, well, both Rand and Karen, at the end of, um, of, um, of Night of Dreams, were in a place where they needed to grow a whole lot before the last battle could happen. Um, Egwene was basically there. Um, she needed to show it, but she was basically there. Um, Matt was basically there because he's Matt. And, you know, 
I, expecting um, Matt to have deep character growth is expecting a, an opossum to get up and dance a jig. He does have it, but you know, he's not going to show it to you. Um, it, it's, it's layered deeply under, in, in there. And so, um, but Brandon um, and Perrin both have these huge distances to go character-wise. Um, and in a lot of cases, I was using my instincts. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it seems to me like I talk about these things, it, it sounds like I, I, I just made stuff up, but um, as a writer, you read like 11 books of the Wheel of Time, and it's like listening to a pianist play a familiar tune and then stop two notes from the end. Every music theory person out there can go, oh, these are the next two notes. Um, and reading the Wheel of Time, I knew the next notes. It's just obvious to me what the next notes were for things like Karen's um, growth and, and, and Rand's growth. And having the notes, it, it, it seems very obvious to me. I'm like, this is what needs to happen. This is where he was going. And so let's build that out. Um, and that's another reason why, you know, it was, it was good to bring on a writer. Harriet always said, people asked her when we were on tour, frequently, like, so did you ever consider writing it yourself? She's like, no, I'm an editor. I need to have something, even something, you know, mediocre. I can take something good and make it excellent. I can take something mediocre and make it good. You know, this is what I do. Um, and I'm hoping that mine wasn't mediocre and good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? Like, that's what she needed. She, she needed something to work with. Um, and it's a different skill set. But anyway, so there you go. Um, I, I, I had a lot of free reign in that area, and it's one of the places where I, um, where I said we need to kind of push this forward, and they never even questioned on that on Team Jordan. They were completely on board on that. There's things when I do things like, you know, let's go to Shara, or um, let's, let's uh, show these glimpses of the future, or things like that, like, mm, let's be careful, um, and, and things like that. I eventually want to know around most cases. So. <laughs> when well, you already answered one of the questions that I have, closer to writing some characters and others, and it's very clear. He really had a great time writing Perrin, and yeah. felt like Perrin was like your guy. Perrin was my guy. Um, I, I've always loved Perrin. He's always been my favorite of the three, um, and he was very natural for me to write. Um, so yes, uh, the other thing that I did that you may have heard of is um, when I went back to Charleston, so the second time when I pitched the outline, I said, I really feel like we need a sequence of viewpoints in the Black Tower. Um, and I don't feel from the way that the notes are and from my own instincts that we can have a main character there other than Pavara. And I would really like to show an Ashraman viewpoint. Is there an Ashraman who um, that we know nothing about from Robert Jordan's notes that I can take over, basically, um, and, and play with how I want? Um, and they, um, they said, yes, here's this guy, Andrew. Um, we don't know anything about him, um, go for it. And I took Andrew, and I, I also did this because I felt, you know, each real time book added characters to kind of they, um, and elevated them from, from just a name to a uh, personality, and each book had done that with different characters. And I felt we out of place in the last book didn't have somebody that became more to the, the forefront. And I, I really wanted an Ashman so I could play with gateways. It's kind of, you know, my brain and magic system thing. I love magic systems. And, uh, but the Wheel of Time, I wasn't. When I, I didn't want to go in and change the magic system. I want I liked it as it was, even though it didn't fall, you know, it wasn't the style of magic system I knew. It was a wonderful magic system and I wanted to use it like he used it, but I did want to take like a few aspects of it and really kind of play with it the way that I play with magic. And I want to do some what I want to do is um, parent in the little string, push that really far along what he could do. And uh, and the other one was gay. Like, no one, I'm like, if we had these things, they would be so awesome. Um, and you could do so many cool things with them. And so I pitched the idea of, um, of an ashram who had the talent for making gateways. Um, Captain T. Talent. And um, so they gave me Andrew to, to just basically uh, do whatever I wanted with. And people have mentioned, and I, I kind of feel bad about this. They, they're like, it feels like Andrew strolled out of one of your books in the Wheel of Time. And it, it kind of does. And I apologize for that. I think that's, I don't want to be distracting like that, but that's kind of what Andrew is. It's someone who strolled out of one of my books in the Wheel of Time. Um, <laughs> And so, um, yeah. And then I think I have one other question. Mm -hmm. Was there anything in the notes that surprised or shocked you? Yeah, when, uh, when Tom and Maureen got engaged, I'm like, what? <laughs> and the assistants are like, no, it's in there. It's in there. It's in, it's in this chapter, this chapter. And I go look, and I look back, and when I did my reread, I'm like, oh. I guess it is in there, but boy, I didn't miss that one. Like, I think they were maybe, like, you know, I, I thought they were maybe the first stage, stage you know, that I knew there was something there, but 
the fact that they were ready to be engaged and off screen, they had spent uh, enough time together that they were they were uh, filming on board. But that surprised me. That was the biggest shocker uh, for me. Um, the very scene was a surprise, but kind of more of a cool surprise. Like I knew something was going on there, and I read all the theories. And I'm like, yeah, you're you're the bomb, uh, girl. So. So the very one I would see actually was surprising, but it was kind of the awesome surprising, whereas uh, Tom Warren was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I'm not a movie of these people. I know who they are, but yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm quite aware of Tom Warren. So you weren't surprised by the film that was uh, No, because that had been talked over so much online. I read all the theories, and then he got out of the movie, and I'm like, oh, that group's right. Well, this, the rest of the group's going to hate me. Um, <laughs> and then I put it in, they're going to, yeah. But they, I, we put it in, in the, um, those don't know, we put it in, in the, um, the glossary of Towers of Midnight because we didn't know anything. It's just a post it note to me. I'm like, I'm going to make it a post it note to them. I'm just going to stick it in the exact same way, and then they can be just as frustrated as I am, not knowing anything more about it than who it was. So. What exactly did Lancaster use in compulsion on Karen? Did it have an off your back in the Dragonborn where she visited an industry and talked to him about glory? Um, no, because uh, Lanthier actually considers compulsion to be a, a crude tool that she didn't want to have to use. Um, and back then, she was more confident in her ability to, to do it without compulsion. Um, by this point, she was far more desperate. Um, and, um, and she was willing to kind of get her hands more dirty, if that makes sense. So no, that was not something that they studied all, all the way back there. Well, I did ask specifically on that. Uh, as we were developing um, um, this thing. Um, so, yeah. Lanthier's not, Lanthier considers compulsion like, that's the, the other persistence thing, she can do it without. Um, but in this book, uh, she needed, uh, she had some very intricate plans, um, many of which I still haven't seen fans uh, picking out. So, and not as all, not, all as not as it seems when it comes to Lanthier in this book. Okay, so are we going to go to the, the audience? Let's who's going to call on people. Is that your job? That's my job. Okay, go for it. That's, that's why I've been yes. shooting up this whole time. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, so are we going to do a drawing? Where's, where's, where'd Patty go? Patty, let's draw, let's draw out names and get, we have memory keeper trips. Yeah, these, these things are fun there. Um, for the book tour, we did like, like a rock star, like city, yeah, like the tour, rock star tour thing. Um, so, all right, I'm going to draw out. There's one in each size. Okay. So I need to draw you out and then. Okay, well we'll do one question while we pick the last tickets. Okay. Um, the first one first hand I saw was the gentleman in the hat right there. Can you tell us how many named characters made it to print? How many named characters made the print? You mean um, the, whole uh, the whole series? Um, uh, last time I think it was 2,200 something. Um, it might be more than that, but that, that's, that's last time I had. Yeah. Ready to do this drawing? Okay, but no, we, we, didn't, we didn't get to there. Let's do another question. Okay, one more question. Uh, gentleman in the gray shirt there. Well, they did the first, the prequel, the new story. Yes, new story. Have I been authorized to write in the world and do any of these, the other stories, such as New Spring? Um, Harry and I sat down and talked about this um, on the second visit to Charleston. We, we, we went to dinner, and when she said, all right, prequels and uh, the outriders, what do you think? And my line from the beginning was, no. Um, I really don't think we should do any more fiction in the real time world. Um, I feel that, um, you know, I had read interviews with Robert Jordan, and this is where it was coming from. He, before, um, you know, long before he passed away, people would ask, I have to do a fiction series. He's like, I'll have my hard drive reformatted and, you know, melted down. So you better not hope that I finished because otherwise it never been ended. Um, and he changed his mind about that, but I think he did so uncomfortably. Um, he had said many times he did not want other people writing in his world. Um, and um, I hope there's not a punch to the face waiting for me on the other side. Um, but I know there would be if. I didn't stop now. Um, I think out of respect for him and his wishes, um, it, needs, it needs to be done. Um, and so 
I, 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 I said from the beginning that, and that was where Harriet was coming from. Um, it wasn't that I had to convince her. Uh, she just wanted to hear my argument because she was hearing the publisher's argument on the other side. The publisher wanted as much as we could get um, because that's you know that's the publisher's job to, to, to get cool books and release them for you all. Um, and so what might happen, and if if um, if I have any influence over it, it will happen. Is we might be able to see some of the other shows because he left some brief notes about the other prequels. Um, where he was going to write one about um, uh, about uh, Tam going to war. That's the one I really wanted to see. And another about Marion Land, a second one about Marion Land. Um, uh, if I have my way, we will see these done as video games um, or other media. Something that is kind of expanding the universe ish, so we don't have to worry about his legacy in the same way. But you know, I can imagine an awesome sort of like, you know, next door Republic style RPG where you are playing as Tam and you know you're leaving the two rivers and you, I mean you can have a really awesome open world RPG there. Um, and then with Shark and you could do a great one like that too. Um, and so that's what I have really pushed for is I'm like, let's do this. Um, before the inevitable question comes about uh, film properties. Um, Universal holds the rights to the Wheel of Time. Uh, they have been developing it as a feature film, uh, Eye of the World. Um, a lot of us on the inside have encouraged a television show. Um, I, am, I have told them several times, look guys, this would make a much better TV show. Um, and so I'm hoping that they will go that direction. Um, that I, I don't know at all um, what, what they're going to end up doing, but I know they, you know, when I talk to them, they've listened, and that's what Harry has kind of said too. She feels like a television show would be a better way to go. So, so uh, we don't know, um, but Universal holds the rest. All right, let's do a few of these. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, 178, which I assume is what everyone's has. 761. 761. No, no 761. Yay! Uh -huh. 
Good question. Did he dictate who went to live and die? This is one of the things that he left a lot on. Um, specifically, you know, um, where people ended up and who survived and who didn't. Uh, but there was one major character that Ice made a call on. He didn't, he didn't say specifically, and one major character that Harriet made a call on. Um, otherwise, if you didn't say anything, we had them live. Uh, so there's two, one major character I killed and one major character Harriet killed. Um, I haven't announced mine. Uh, she announced hers. It was Swan, um, was her character. Uh, she had always identified with Swan and she wanted, you know, uh, Swan to, uh, anyway, this is, she, she felt it was appropriate for what we needed to do. Uh, um, and the reason we did this is sitting down, um, we, we all decided that, you know, that we need, that the last battle couldn't happen without some um, some fairly high profile casualties. Um, and we didn't know, we were fairly sure that Robert Jordan was going to make the call, but he hadn't made the call. He's very attached to his characters, and he would probably have not made the call until he was writing those last scenes um, as a discovery writer. And so um, we felt that, you know, you, you can't go into the last battle and call the last battle um, unless some serious stuff is going down. So, um, so we both uh, we made our calls, and uh, that's how it happened. But almost everybody, uh, Robert Jordan, said. So okay, before we get to the next question, if people are taking pictures and you can just not have the flash go off, that would be appreciated. Okay, next question. Um, Pac-Man. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little more about how much they know about the Age of Legends? Uh, how much they know, um, how much the characters in the world know about the Age of Legends? Well, Rand knows a whole bunch. <laughs> So um, it, it, it spans from Rand and the, the Forsaken, who know a lot, to everyone else basically only having fragments of books. The, the breaking was pretty devastating. Um, the war followed by the breaking, followed by all the stuff that happened. So I mean, they have books that talk about things, but you'll find like in, in um, when they're trying to figure out um, the, if one of the Forsaken is hiding in the, the White Tower and Towers of Midnight, if you go read that, you can find, you know, they find these books and they've got quotes, but they're like quotes from people who heard from someone else who read from a book that's no longer around. So they don't know very much at all. Um, how much is in the notes? How much is in the notes? Um, the notes focus most exclusively on the Third Age. There is more in the notes than you know, um, but, the, but not a whole lot. Like, most everything we know um, and most everything that's in the notes, we know there are tidbits here and there that are fun. Uh, but it's, there, it's not like the notes have this huge, exhaustive, extensive, you know, it's not like we have a whole worth um, of just writing on the Age of Legends. We have tidbits here and there. Exactly one to one the same, 
and that was uh, our goal. And I think that theory is also equally strong. Robert Jordan did not tell people. It might be in the notes, but I'm not going to tell you because he specifically, you know, this is one thing that he wanted people to be, be theorizing on. Um, before I was involved in this, and I just say that it's not that I changed, you know, maybe I changed my mind, maybe I I was always a, a fan of the, it is our world, but the, um, the, the first stage was our time theory. I mean, the fact that, that there's the first stage symbol, and there's, you know, they talk about America and Russia, and, and things like that, as, as legends during their time. You don't know they do, they, yeah. Um, all of this stuff indicates to me that that's what Robert Jordan wanted to apply, but um, we don't know for sure. Yeah, so can we hear some of uh, Lanfear's other plans? That... No, you've got to be in the mountain here. <laughs> Obviously, Rappo. What are we going to read? You can read the books again and find out. <laughs> Who came up with that one? Because there was a lot of texting happening for like three days. Do you know what he did? <laughs> yeah, that was hard. Um, that was um, the, the general that was actually more me. Um, Robert Jordan indicated <laughs> that several of the generals were to die, um, and, but he didn't indicate how. And, but one of the things we need to do is we need to construct a narrative where this entire war was happening, but also where the war chapters didn't all just feel like every other war chapter. Um, and we also, I wanted something where, you know, I wanted um, uh, Forsaken plots to come in a big way to be meaningful and important to this. That the Forsaken weren't just out there slogging it out, um, that, there were, that there were plots and intricacies um, hiding in the background. And so um, I, I pitched even in that first visit, um, the, um, the great captains, um, you know, being a target, and they would be. Um, there was also, you know, in Robert Jordan's notes, an indication that and at this point they give everything over to Matt. I'm like, why would they give everything over to Matt? Well, it seems obvious to me that Matt um, it can be immune to this. Um, that, you know, he's, he's, he's immune to the one power, and as long as he's got his, his medallion. And that seems like a perfect reason that they, even though they all kind of, they all trust Matt, but not really, but kind of, would give everything over to him, uh, the gambler. Um, and so, anyway, that was, that was a, a plot sequence I pitched to them um, in April of 2008, or June of 2008. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. The gentleman in the flat over here. Uh, you spoke about Anthro a little bit more, him being more your character. Were you expecting the, it's almost like a 50-50 split. Everyone either loved him, or everyone thought he was a horrible player. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally expected that, 50-50 um, <laughs> split. That's, that, that um, because, um, I was going so far with the magic system with him um, that I knew there would be some people that would, uh, that would find him, um, that they would not be comfortable with that. And I knew others would, would be like, yeah, this is awesome. This is what I want in real time to be. And that's, that's one of the things you run into by having a, uh, a fan be in church um, is that, you know, in most cases, I'm trying to do things that are not going to be that divisive. Um, I'm trying to, you know, keep the soul of the series, and all of the, everything I'm trying to keep the soul of the series. But at the end of the day, um, the fans don't get along. We do not get along. This is why we have websites where we argue. Um, and knowing that, knowing that about fandom, there were, there were choices that I was going to make that half the fandom would, would hate no matter what I did. I knew that. I was aware of that. And the, the thing you run into by having a fan in charge is, my theories, when we have nothing else to go on, end up as the ones that end up in the polls. And I'm sorry, but that's just how it had to be. Um, you know, there was no, like, you know, my interpretation of Lance as, as a character is an interpretation, and through his viewpoint, because we haven't seen it a lot of him, that some fans are not going to like. And some fans will be like, yeah, that's exactly how I saw Lance. He's in, on the inside, he, sees, he, he doesn't see himself as stone cold, you know. He's, he's a person on the inside. He's just, has such, you know, he, he just is so good at not telegraphing his emotions from the outside. You see him as this cold rock of a man, you go inside, and he's a normal person. That's my interpretation of Land, how I've, I've always seen him. When I write him that way, some people are like, no, this isn't Land. Land doesn't have that much emotion. Um, and Land is, and that's, that's a valid interpretation, and he's strong. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we argue about this, and there's no way to do it both ways in, uh, in some of these things. If, you know, with gateways, 
Um, there's no way to have it both ways. Either we stay with just doing it in, um, you know, kind of more normal way, or we go completely bonkers like I went. You can't, you know, I, I suppose you could have gone a little bit bonkers, but I can never find one a little bit bonkers. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I was aware that doing some of these things were things that some fans wouldn't, wouldn't like. That's also partially why, um, by the end of the book, Andrew Rolls did a fun character that's uh, done some important things, but he's not central. Um, to the plot because, you know, he's still a side character. I had a lot of fun with him, but the story is about Angel. The story is about Perrin, Rand, Max, um, Edwin, um, and to a lesser extent, Nynaeve, um, and, um, and Avi, and, and Elaine. And so, yeah, you know, the big six are what the book's about, and I, I can have fun with side characters. Tomanis is another one. The, you saw my interpretation of Tomanis. I've always read him as Tommy Chief. Some readers do not read him as Tommy Chief, they read him as oblivious. Um, and that's a perfectly valid interpretation that is wrong. Uh, <laughs> and if I'm going to write from the viewpoint of it, you know, I'm going to express the way I read the character. So, there you go. And I'm sorry if that, I hope it didn't ruin the book for anybody, but I do understand that some people are going to run across the Tom Hines and just shake their heads right now. This is Tom Hines. Uh, and that's, that's okay. Alright, we've got time for one more. Uh, Complicated equation, I'm sure. I just want to know, was it your idea for a 200-page chapter or his idea? 200-page chapter. I want to know who to curse when I read You can curse me. <laughs> uh, that was another one of my audacious things that I pitched um, because it's not that audacious, it's a little bit audacious. My goal with the chapter was when you get to this chapter, the, the characters cannot put down their weapons. They can't really, you know, they've got, they've got to keep fighting. They're fighting for their lives. It's the end of all things. I didn't want you to be able to easily put down the ball. Uh, I'm going to read one more chapter. And then that chapter takes like five hours or whatever. Like, it should take five hours. It's like a three hour chapter to read. And I wanted you to be like, man, I can't put this down. It's 2 a.m. I got to finish this chapter though. And then I wanted to end that chapter in a way that you're like, Right, and turn the next page. <laughs> and then the next one's very short for that reason. Like that, that I, you can do things with chapter length and with the form of a book where you bounce between people and characters that I find very fascinating. You can have an effect on the reader by the way you shape just where the chapters are, not even the content, the length of them, and how they bounce between one another. And this is something I really like to try to play with because I think it's a, a, an underutilized um, part of, uh, of, of a novel. Um, they can do fun things. So the 200-page chapter was me doing my um, my thing. I sure remember the first year. Yes, first year. Yeah. All right, so we're done. Uh, I believe, uh, but I should have announced my booth number because I'm going to. Uh, I might bring some more stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah,